Hindi ko na patatagalin. Let's hear the word of God from Pastor Dennis. Iba talaga pag 11 a.m. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Man, it's so it's so exciting to be here. Um, good morning, everyone who are watching with us at uh, Facebook Live. Tayo, no? Hindi naman TikTok yun, ano? <laughs> Facebook. Okay, Facebook Live. Everyone at home, you are with us, and we pray that, uh, of course, uh, the Holy Spirit who is here is also with you. So we pray He touches your heart as well. Uh, I am just so glad to be here. I've always wanted to come back. By the way, hi, Pastor Jim. Balita ko, Facebook Live siya. No? Mga seniors daw, Facebook Live. Eh. <laughs> well, I'm so glad. I've been wanting to come back here to preach the word. Many of you might not recognize me. I was here a few years ago, but God has called me to another service, uh, rather worship place. So, Victory Mandaluyong. So, if you're somewhere in uh, Mandaluyong, we welcome you there. We're planting a church there. But this is a great place to be in. Family, right? This is a great place to be in. I. Sino to? Ah, si Connie. <laughs> um, uh, I'm so excited, and I just wanted to take this time to thank Pastor Dennis, C., our senior pastor, for allowing me to come back here for this day and preach the word. Uh, Pastor Dennis, wherever you are, I pray your foot is doing okay and you're able to walk and enjoy your time with family. Family, family, family. I keep on re- repeating this word because we are on the third week on our topic on the theology of family. And our series, our last days today, is entitled, As for Me and My Household, As for Me and My Family. Uh, this is Joshua in Joshua 14 saying this, declaring it to the church of Israel that as of for me and my household, for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. So for the past three weeks, we have been talking about God's plan and mission and purpose for the family. The first week we were talking about the family itself. What is the family supposed to look like? The second week, we were talking about the father of the family. Uh, last week, week was Father's Day. I hope the fathers here had a great time last week. Man, this church has really upped things in celebration. This place is beautiful. And I, I really thank uh, Pastor Dennis for what he's doing in this church. This week, we will continue to talk about the family. However, it will be more of uh, the relationship between fathers, parents, and their children. Oh, wow. Our Chinese missions are here. Wow. Hello. Good to see you. We're going to be looking at what is God's purpose for the family and what is the family supposed to look like relationally. Now, speaking of family, maybe some of you don't know my family. Let me introduce them to you. Uh, this is a picture, one of our latest pictures of my family. Okay? So that's my wife, Meg, and I think we're 26 years old, uh, 26 years, uh, 26 years uh, together. She's, she's happy and I'm married, so we're happily married. <laughs> Our daughter, Erica, had just turned 23 last June 2, uh, 21 rather. I'm going to get it later. Um, she's in UP studying fine arts. Uh, Josh just turned 23, and uh, he's graduating from Ateneo in August. And of course, that's me. Uh, I am dark there because I'm the one taking the picture, of course. And of course, uh, the fifth member of her family, Tom. <laughs> my uh, twin. Parang ayon yung maniwala. I am a die-hard Top Gun fan. <laughs> have you watched Top Gun? Yes. How many how many times have you watched Top Gun? <laughs> I intend to watch Top Gun 100 times in the next three months. I'm a fan of Top Gun, and our, our fa- whole family is a fan of Top Gun. It's because I have always dreamt of becoming a pilot. And uh, I never got to join the Air Force. I joined the, the, or not even the Navy, which, but I joined the Army. Nevertheless, that's my family. But uh, if we talk about family, there's one picture of my family that I really, really keep in mind. It's really dear to me. I even post it in my Facebook page. Uh, It's this picture. A picture of when they were very small, and uh, Josh could actually do that to me without killing me. He does it now. I'm, I won't be on the stage right now. Um, but 
I, when I look at this picture, even today, I tend to remember the many uh, plans and dreams of my children when they were that small. You know, uh, Erica had always wanted to be a princess. Uh, how many women here wanted to be princess when you were small? None. Okay, at least uh, Erica is the only one who will become a princess. Uh, hindi, hindi kasama yung nandito. <laughs> Josh, on the other hand, his dream was, he said, Daddy, when I grow up, I want to be a fire truck. <laughs> Not fireman, fire truck. I said, okay, this will be uh, difficult. I really have to change his mind about some issues in life. Anak, you cannot be a fire truck. But kids always have dreams. Did you have dreams of who you wanted to be? I wanted to be a Miralco lineman. Oh. Oh. And then after that, I want to be a taxi driver. But when I saw that the taxi driver was being caught by the police, I wanted to be a policeman. <laughs> we all have dreams. We have dreams for our children. And many times these dreams are grand and big and, and we really pray that our children will become who God wants them to be. And that's why it's very, very important that as parents we know God's plan for them and our role in bringing them up. Now some of you might not be parents, you might be uncles, aunties, lolos, lolas. Or you might be here unmarried Still hoping to get married. But you're discipling somebody. And that person that you're discipling, you can, can, you can consider to be somebody God put in your life for you to bring up as the next generation. And so, all of us are involved in this thing. God has a plan for the family. Even from the beginning of time, in Genesis chapter 1, Koni Makiniga, Verse 28, God had already told Adam and Eve, and God blessed them, it says there, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. God said, magpakarami kayo. Reminder, God gave this even before sin entered the picture. What was God's plan? He wanted who were created in his own image and likeness to spread all over the world so the world would be filled with people who know how to worship God. That was an awesome, awesome purpose, an awesome, awesome mission given to Adam and Eve. But they failed. In fact, mankind had failed so much, God decided, I'm going to bring a flood into this place to kill all of the generations. But guess what? God saved one family. And guess what? When they came out of the, uh, when Moses came out of the ark, uh, Noah. Okay, at least I know you're listening. <laughs> so it was, it was Noah, not, not, not Moses, okay? When Noah came out of the ark, guess what? God spoke to him. Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, he said this. He said, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful. Multiply, fill the earth. Guess what? The mission never changed. God, after destroying the wickedness and the evil in the world, still said, this world needs to be polluted. No, not polluted. Populated. I always mix up those words. Populated with men and women who would worship God. In Malachi, chapter 2, verse 15, God even becomes more specific. He was talking about the family, but now he's even talking to the mother and the father. And he says there, has not the Lord made them one? He's talking about husband and wife, not husband and husband, not wife and wife. It's husband and wife. Has not God made them one? Your marriage, if you're married, or your marriage to be, when that time comes, is not just yours. It is God's plan to bring you together. And look what it says. In flesh and spirit, they are His. Your marriage does not only belong to you, it belongs to God. For which reason? There is no reason to disrupt what God has put together because it belongs to Him. Then look at it. Why one? Why did He bring them together? 
It is because he was seeking godly offspring. He's not just seeking populated world. He was seeking a populated world populated by godly offspring. Worshippers. So it behooves us as fathers and mothers, disciples, to make sure the people that we are bringing up are godly. And by the way, he was not only talking about godly offspring, making them uh, physiologically donating your sperm and donating your egg. They come together nine months, boom, baby. He was not just talking about that. He was talking about giving your life into the life of your child, the life of the person you're discipling. Giving, husband giving, wife giving, giving of life so that that person would become godly. Because there are so many families out there where there are fathers and there are mothers But the children are growing up not to be worshippers of God. Because the people they see are not worshippers of God. I was just talking to uh, Nika earlier and asking, how's Prince? Prince is the son of the king. (laughs) No, 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 that's his real name. And his father is really the king. And I was asking, uh, she was making cuento how how Prince has grown up to become a leader. Sabi ko, saan ang galing yun? Sabi niya, well, king is a leader. And me, sabi niya, I, I'm fond of history, so the boy is fond of history. What does it tell us? We have a large impact in the next generation, and Prince will become who he is because of his parents. The children will become who they will become because of their parents. So it's, it's a heavy responsibility given to us. I said here, God uses the institutions of marriage and family to bring glory to himself through multi-generational missional worshipers. Take note of that. Multi-generational. You're not just thinking of your generation. You're thinking of us, the younger generation. Parang ayon yung maniwala. Missional. There's a mission. God has gave us a mission. And it's to make sure the next generation spread out and become worshipers as well. That reminds me of the story of Timothy. Timothy is a person in the New Testament. He's a young person. At the time that he was seen by Paul who discipled him, he was something like from 16 to 18 years old. And Paul, in a letter later on, wrote to Timothy and said this, I I am reminded of your sincere faith. Not just faith. Not just coming to service, but sincere. Something that's inside. Not something for attendance and say, God, I went na. No, it's something inside. Faith that's sincere. A faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Louise, and your mother, Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. Kumbaga, Mana, mana. But let me make a statement right now. Faith is a personal thing. You know, someday, sometimes you hear children saying, when I ask them, oh, so how long have you become a, been a Christian? How, how long have you been a follower of Jesus Christ? And some of them would say, ah, I was a Christian. Uh, I was born in a Christian family. So they are saying that their Christianity, their faith, is because their mother and father are Christians. That's why they're Christians. That's wrong. Faith is personal. Faith is something given to you by the Holy Spirit. It is taught by the grandmother, by the mother, and it is caught, but it is the Holy Spirit who gives it to you. And so we need to make sure that although our children are in kids' church, by the way, congratulations, Pastor King and our kids' church teachers for a fine job you're doing. Yeah. Although they come to our youth services, congratulations, Pastor Robert and his team. I heard they had an awesome worship night last Thursday. Parang ayaw nilang umuwi. But although they come to that, it doesn't mean they have faith just because their parents are Christians. 
They need to declare Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior as well. How will that happen? We, the now generation, need to teach them. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to look at observations on multi-generational discipleship. And we're going to ask the questions, what do multi-generational worshipers look like? We're going to ask the question, am I a multi-generational worshiper? My prayer is, you are fed with the Word of God today. And you're so busog because you came today. But wait, I pray that you won't just be busog. That's why we have masks, so that you won't eat the Word. But the Word will go in your heart, and you will be busog in your heart. So much so, you're going to ask the question, am I a multi-generational worshiper? Or am I going to step out this room having said, done that, check, I'm going to go to lunch. My prayer is when we leave this place, we're wondering, okay, am I doing what Paul did for Timothy? Whether it's my children or whether it's people God has put in my life to disciple. Am I a multi-generational Ge- Am I a multi-generational worshiper? We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 16, 1 to 5. And as is my custom, I'm not sure if you still do it here. May I ask you to please stand up. If you have a Bible, please open it to Acts chapter 16, verse 1 to 5. And if you have the same Bible as I am, I have, it's in page 1190. You can also use your cell phones, by the way. So, we're looking at the story of Paul and Timothy, chapter 16 of Acts, verse 1, where it says, Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So... The churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. That's the word of the Lord for today. Father, we are grateful for this opportunity to be hit in the heart by the Holy Spirit, molded and, 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 and used by Him. Father, we pray that by the preaching of your word, we will realize and understand what it is really that we are part of a generation you have called, not by accident, but by design to disciple the next generation. Teach us, Lord God. Be honored and glorified as we pay attention and get the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and take your seats. Thank you. Context, always and always and always, when you read scripture, look at context. What is happening surrounding those verses you have just read? So, what's the context? Okay, Paul was on his first missionary journey, going through these cities, ministering to the Greeks. When we say Greeks, they are people who are pagans, they don't believe in God, uh, and also there were Jews. He was ministering to the Jews as well. One of those times, he came into one of those places where there were Jews, and part of the Jewish people there were Pharisees. And the Pharisees were, asked, were telling the people who had started to receive Jesus Christ, they were saying, these guys need to be circumcised. And they need to start practicing the traditions of the Jewish people. So for them, accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior was not enough. They needed to be circumcised. So with that question, Paul had to go back to Jerusalem to present to the, the bar, Board of uh, Apostles, Board of Apostles, BOA, this question, what are we supposed to do with people who have received the Lord? They're not Jews, they're Greeks. They're not Jews, 
when the Jews are saying these people need to be circumcised. So there was a meeting of sorts and by the power of the Holy Spirit, wisdom came and they decided, okay, they don't need to be circumcised, but they need to follow uh, the commandments of the Lord. They, don't, they need to avoid eating uh, meat with the blood still in there and so on and so forth. So with that, Paul and Barnabas took off and said, we're going to go back to the cities that we ministered to and start telling them about this new decision so that those churches will be strengthened and their faith will be deepened and more and more will become believers of Jesus Christ. So that's what they did. They started going around. That was the second uh, missionary journey of Paul. There came a time, excuse me, there came a time when uh, Paul and Barnabas were going to another city, they had a disagreement. Why? Because Barnabas wanted to take with them a man named Mark. Okay? Paul didn't want it. Why? For Paul, Mark left them in the ministry to do something else. Kumbaga, iniwanan sila. Am I allowed to speak Tagalog here? Okay lang. Sir, I can speak a little. Okay. So, they said, no, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna no, allow Mark to join our team. So, Barnabas took Mark and went somewhere else, while Paul took Silas and went to where our story begins. Now, before we begin that story, let me make a quick commentary about disagreement in the church. Because we are all humans, and churches are run by men and women who make decisions based on experience, there is likely to be a case of disagreement amongst them. It can and may happen to all churches. When that does, don't take sides, neither should you jump to other churches. That church that you're going to, no matter how perfect it is, will become imperfect because you joined it. <laughs> Meaning to say we're all imperfect. So when these times happen, focus on focus on Jesus Christ alone. Focus on what He wants you to do. And if it is to follow this one person who is doing this, then follow that person without saying those people kasi are not doing this. Because Regardless of what happens to these disagreements, God will always use it to expand His church. Barnabas expanded the church of God where he went, and Paul expanded the church where he went. God is sovereign. Amen? And before it becomes a preaching on that, let's proceed. I just had to say that. So, what do multi-generational worshipers look like? That's what we're looking at. Now, before this turns out to be a preaching on parenting, which it might look like, we're going to be talking about Paul who discipled Timothy. Let me tell you this. We are talking about two generations. We're talking about the now generation, which is the generation of Paul. And we're talking about the next generation, which is the generation of my generation, Timothy. Which is to say, there's always been talk that the youth is the future of the church. I beg to disagree. The youth is the church. The youth is with us. So whether you're the age of Pastor Jim or my age, the youth, We are all part of the church. So let's not say, uh, let's teach them someday they will take the reins. Yes, they will take the reins someday, but we teach them today. They are part of us, okay? So let's look at what happens. We're talking about the now generation, the next generation. First one, it says, Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra, a church, churches they had planted during the first uh, missionary journey. He went back to give the news. Let's stop there. 
Paul came. What does it tell us about an, the attitude of a missional worshiper of God, multi generational? Paul came. First lesson if you are the now generation, be present. Be present. Many times we are present, but we're not fathering. Many times we're present, but we're not mothering. Many times the mother or the father is called iPad. I'm around, but so that the child will not disturb my watching Netflix, I give him iPad. That's not being present. If you want to, to disciple your children, be there. Not just physically, but even in the heart. I have a desire to teach this. I, I, uh, during lunch or dinner, I'm not going to give, especially when you go to a restaurant, I'm not going to give an iPad so that the child will behave and won't make noise. No. I am going to teach him how to behave. Behave ka naman, diba? I'll teach him how to behave. This is how it should be done when we're eating out. So no iPad, no iPhone. Stand still. No, don't stand still. Sit still. Be there. Be present. And that's why I am so... Uh, I'm so kilig about the story of one of my running mates. Uh, running mates. I joined a real-life 50K run for Victory Makati huh? back in 19, uh, 2017. We were seven members in the team. I was one of them. <laughs> I was the youngest. <laughs> Actually, reverse. I was the oldest. And one of my team, uh, two of my team members were the husband and wife uh, couple, um, Paolo and Chriselle Rulona. They're actually in the back. Can you raise your hands? Yeah, that's them, okay? Chriselle, at that time, was actually a flight attendant of PAL. And if you go visit her website, her FB page, you'll see all the beautiful places she's traveled to. And guess what? Paolo gets to ride free on PAL. Crappy benefits. Pwede bang magpa-adapt sa inyo? Grabe, they were, you should look at their, her snow, more snow. <laughs> but they were, she was apart from her children. Notwithstanding all the beautiful things coming into her life, because she was a flight attendant, guess what? She decided to quit. She decided to quit to be with her children. To personally attend to their needs. Guess what? Right now, she is actually doing homeschooling with them. Making sure they're learning values, knowledge. Now, hey, thank you for doing that. Can we give the Lord a hand for this couple? <laughs> but wait, I'm not telling you to quit your job. Sabi ni Dennis, quit your job. Si Dennis yun, hindi ako. Then, then, this is Pastor Dennis. I'm not telling you to quit your job to be with your family. What I'm telling you is be present. Know how to balance things. When you come home, don't bring your, home, your homework with you. That's for children. Homework's for children. Don't bring home your work with you. Be present in their lives. Speak to them. Know what's happening in their lives. Who is their FFB? BFF. Yeah. What's happening in their lives? How is the pandemic affecting them? Who are you talking to at 2 a.m.? Where are you at 10 p.m.? Be present. That's what Chrisel and Paolo are doing. So if you're a Paul generation, the now generation, ask yourself, am I involved in the lives of my children? And I'm not just talking about baking nice food for them. Providing for them. Be involved. Now look what happens in Timothy's case. Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. A disciple was 
there. What does that tell us? His name was Timothy. He was the son of a Jewish woman. Okay. So he's along the line of Abraham, Jewish, who was a believer. Okay. Christian. The mother was Christian. But his father was a Greek. That means he was never baptized. That means he was never circumcised. Because the father did not allow it. But here's the thing. He was well spoken of by the brothers in Atlistra and Iconium. As a Christian, he had a weakness. As a Christian, he had not a weakness, a limitation. He did not fulfill, fulfill all the requirements of the Jewish law. So whoever listened to him, to them, they were cool. he was kulang. That was his limitation. And yet, the people saw him to be somebody who was well spoken of. Which means, he did not just come here to service. Just like Sky is with us in service. Dropped off by his fa- her father, Pastor Lee J. No. He was somehow, it doesn't tell us, but he was somehow involved in the service. So much so that people saw him and say, this is a good guy. This is a strong disciple. He did not just sit down in service and listen. He was doing something. To the point that people had something to say, something good to say about him. What did he do? He was present. He came. He showed up. If you are the next generation, be present. Show up. Make the faith that was passed on to you by your parents, make it your own faith. Practice it. Put it to practice. Volunteer. Come on stage and sing. They just might allow you. They, didn't, they never allowed me. But they just might. Be present. Ask yourself, am I involved in the life of my church? Or am I just a recipient? Be present. Second, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places for they all knew that his father was a Greek. What are we learning here? Hey, wait! Paul went to Jerusalem to ask a question about circumcision. The decision was you don't have to circumcise. But why is now Paul circumcising Timothy? The answer is there and Paul saw it. The answer is because the people that they were going to minister to were Jews. And to be acceptable to the Jews, to listen to your testimony, you need to be like us. And Paul saw that and he says, oh, this is going to be a limitation on Timothy. We need to circumcise him. What Paul was doing was he was open. As the now generation, we need to be open. Don't be sarado. When we say open, what does that mean for the now gen? The now gen needs to be open. What mean, that means it need, they need to be humble. How did Paul show humility? He actually considered a younger person to be part of his team. He was open to the fact that somebody aged 16 to 18, somewhere there, can be part of his team to go on missions. He did not say, marami ka pang kakainin. You'll eat a lot of stuff yet. No. What he did was, he was open to identifying this guy and casting the vision and saying, you can be with me. I want you to be with my team. But he did not just say, you can be a leader. He didn't end there. He actually was open to preparing and building up Timothy to be a great leader. How did he prepare? Easy. Circumcision. It was not circumcision to become a Christian. It was a circumcision to become all things to all 
men. First Corinthians chapter 9. All things to all men. Prepare. The now generation needs to be open to preparing the next generation to become leaders. So he took them, he took him in to be circumcised. That reminds me of a member of our church, a pastor of our church, Pastor Lee J and his wife, Lee Ann. I remember two to three years ago, when their son Sean was turning 13, what did they do? They invited men of the church, just like this guy, uh, who's this guapo guy? Bobby, Bobby Paras, and some other guapo guys. Alam na. What were they there for? They came and spoke in front, blessing this young man, speaking vision into his life, telling him the great plans and prophecies, prophesying over his life about what God had planned for him, giving him direction. That's what we ought to be doing. You're awfully quiet. That's what it means. We as the Paul generation need to say, do I prepare my children for the mission? Because remember, they're not just offspring to go all over the earth. They, are, they should be godly offspring. Are we preparing the next generation to be worshipers of Jesus Christ? The, 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 now, the next generation... How, do they, how are they supposed to be? They should be open as well. How do we know that Timothy was open? Well, simple. At 15, 16, 17, 18, what did he do? He allowed himself to be circumcised. And if you're a male right now, you know what that means. He didn't say, no, 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 no way, no way, no way you're going to do that to me. No, no, no. He said, sure, I understand. I'm open to it. For the next generation, if you're next generation, what does open mean for you? It means you need to humble yourself. You are not the best creation of God on this earth for the benefit of mankind. You need to humble yourself and say, I need a mentor. I need somebody who will speak into my life. If you do not have, like Timothy, he never had a father who would speak to him about Christian values. You need to look for men who can speak Christian values. Women who can speak Christian character into your life. Initiate. Don't wait for them to come to you. How are you open? You need to accept it when they say, no, no, no. That's not the right thing to do. Here's the right thing to do. Many times when we are rebuked, we rebel. Timothy, who was going to be circumcised, did not rebel. He was open to it. He saw the bigger picture. He saw, okay, I will be able to minister better if I am circumcised. Be open. It's just like what uh, Pastor Dennis C., our senior pastor said. He said, focus on the effort, not on the outcome. Know the outcome, know the big picture, but if that big, big picture requires you to do this right now, focus on that. Have you given your best in what you are doing? Timothy showed us that he gave his best. He allowed himself to be circumcised. So, as a Timothy generation, ask yourself, do I accept my elders' ways and values? Or am I saying, old-timer ka na? Ano sabi ni Pastor King kanina? Pamphlet? Versus booklet? Accept. Be open to what the older generation has to say to you, to teach you. Be open. Lastly, Acts chapter 16, verse 4, it says, As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered 
to them, to the cities, for observance, the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. Look at what happened when the now generation and the next generation were tugma in their attitude and their character and in their obedience and in their vision of the mission. Look what happened. They were able to do missional work successfully. Now generation, be missional. Next generation, be missional. Think not of your comfort. Think not of the benefits of staying where you are. Sarap dito, aircon eh. Dito na lang. No. Think missional. Who else needs to hear Jesus Christ and accept Him as Lord and Savior? Think. Think. No, 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 no. I like the chairs here. I like the air conditioning. And hey, wow. There are nice, beautiful Christmas lights. Sa bagay, second semester na malapit na mag-Christmas. What am I saying? Don't be comfortable where you are. Be missional. Think of others. To be missional requires thinking less of oneself and more of others. But wait. Kulang. To be missional is to think of Jesus Christ. And the mission that was given to us. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Missional. Here in Victory, we don't just preach it. We do it. And I'm, I'm encouraging you, if you have not gone out of this place thinking who else needs to know about Jesus Christ, I beg you, I pray, today will be a turning point in your life. And you're going to start asking, how can I redirect my children's lives towards Jesus Christ? How can I talk to my co-worker my co-frontliner, my kasosyo, how can I make our conversation go towards Jesus Christ? How? If you are a now generation, think, do I empower my children to be a blessing? Huh? Blessing? Why blessing? Because when God spoke to Abraham, He said, I will bless you and families will be blessed because of you. And we are an extension of that promise to Abraham through Jesus Christ. You are blessed. Not just so you will be blessed. You are blessed to be a blessing. So how many of you considered to be blessed? If you have a face mask on you, you are blessed. How much does a face mask cost? You have money to spend. If you're here today, you are blessed. You know what the greatest blessing is? We're going to heaven. Because we have Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's the greatest blessing. So don't tell me you are not blessed. You are. Now, that blessing is not just for us. It's for us to share to others. So that they too will be blessed. Amen. You need to ask yourself if you're a Timothy. Do I empower my, do I bless others as I am blessed? If you're the younger generation, don't think you are the, the recipient of blessings. No, you too can bless others. Be missional. And when the older generation and the younger generation come together and work together for the very mission that God has given the families of the earth, guess what? They succeed in the mission. Acts chapter 16 verse 5 tells us, So the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. Meaning to say, those who were already Christians, man, they were upbeat. Are you upbeat today? Are you upbeat today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah? 
<laughs> but wait, it's not just us. Those who are not yet Christians will be added to our numbers. Is there an empty seat behind you, in front of you, beside you? That seat needs to be occupied by somebody who has not yet received Jesus Christ. That could be your father, your mother. That could be your office mate. That can be your taxi driver. Your kasambahay. That chair needs to be filled up. We need to go on missions. That reminds me, and I'd like to close with this story. There was this man whose name was Ness. He's that guy encircled. Okay? Now, they're not in Muntinlupa or anything. And they're not the kabarkado of Pastor King. <laughs> but this man was, that, that's a picture from his school. He, was, he used to go to La Salle. And praise God, there are no accidents with God. Amen? Amen? There's no accident with God. God, even when they were in a Catholic school, placed Christians beside this guy, Ness. And these Christians would talk to him and say, Ness, sama ka sama, join us. Let's go to this fellowship and we're going to talk about Jesus Christ. Ness, who was actually a sacristan. You know what a sacristan means? He's a sacristan. Uh, somebody who helps the priest. Altar boy, thank you. This guy... Ness was saying, no, 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 I'm an altar boy. We study theology. In fact, our theology is in, in Latin. So I know what you're talking about. I don't need to hear that. So time passed, time passed. Ness entered the military. He became so busy. He became, he rose in the run. He was a good man. He was a good man. I don't know whether it was because he was brought up good. They would pray in the family every 3 p.m. Devout religious and he was one of those in the military who had integrity one time there was an earthquake in manila the building crumbled they saw gold bars that were hid hidden behind the wall and he could have easily taken those gold bars but what did he do he brought them to the national the central bank of the philippines surrendered everything he got married and his wife said, you know, had you kept one of those, we would be rich by now. <laughs> but he told the line. He was a good man. He rose to the ranks because he was a good man doing his job. Every promotion, every promotion. He came to the point where he became a colonel and was ready to be promoted to general. But because he told the line, he was not into the padrino system. They did not promote him. They gave the promotion to somebody else. They took him out of the position. And because of his frustration, he decided to retire na lang. And these friends from La Salle who kept on inviting him came and said, Oh, Ness, come join us. Now you have time. Now you have time. So one moment, he joins and when he joins, the preacher was preaching, preaching and preaching. And he was sitting behind the guy who turns out to be Pastor Joey Bonifacio. But Ness, when he was listening to the preaching, he said, This guy told this guy about my story. The preacher knows who I am. He's preaching directly to me. He's even looking at me directly. <laughs> that day, he accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And by the way, when he left the military, he cursed God and said, Why me? He made a vow, I will never enter a military camp again. But when he turned around and became born again, God changed his heart. He started to preach the Bible. And God started to bring him into military camps where he started to minister to the military men. Many soldiers today have received Jesus Christ because of this man. And he is a self-confessed, self-righteous man. He realized, yes, he was good. But it was self-righteousness. It, right, it was not the righteousness that came from Jesus Christ. So he started preaching and preaching, and he had one dear prayer in his heart. Lord, I pray for my children. Would you allow them to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior as well. Beautiful prayer of a father. Daughter got saved. First son who was assigned in Holo 
happened to be in Manila, got saved because he shared. The second son was in Baguio studying. There's no way to go up there and share. So that was his prayer. Sana lang. God heard his prayer. God heard his prayer. His son was going to take semestral break. So he was on his, in the bus station to take a bus going home. Not knowing that his father was on the way up. On a bus. And they met at the bus, bus station. <laughs> and the son asked, Oh dad, ano ginagawa mo? what are you doing here? And the father said, I'm going to talk in a hotel. Why don't you join me there? And then, we'll go home together later on. The son said, sure, but I'll go to the city first, and then I'll join you there. When he got to the hotel, the father was already on stage preaching, telling his story about how God restored him. The son saw that there were no more chairs in the hall, so he sat in the back, behind the shadows, listening Listening to how God had changed his father. So much so when the father said, Is there anyone in this room who wants to accept this Jesus Christ to be his Lord and Savior? Guess what? No one raised their hands. Because they were all Christians na pala. But there was one hand in the back that went up. And the father saw it and said, that, that one hand in the back. At last, at least there's one. That man in the back. Can you please come forward and I will pray for you. The young man came out, started walking down the aisle. The father saw his son. The answer to his prayer went down the stage, met him in the middle of the hall, embraced. They both started to cry. And then the elders of the church came and they prayed for him. And that night, the answered prayer came. The son accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That guy, that father, went on to return to the military. He was called back and he was made a general. God had a plan. He joined Victory and he became member of Pastor King's Kids Church and ministered to the next generation. As for the son who had received Jesus Christ last night, he now stands before you preaching the word of God. Last 2016, Father's Day, I stood on the stage, saluted my father and said, Dad, thank you. I am who I am because you were who you were. He responded and saluted. December that year, he passed away. But here's the thing. Though he has gone, the legacy lives on. We preach the gospel to the next generation so that the next generation preaches it to the next generation and the next and the next until the mission is completed and we will say, Lord, Mission accomplished. World is full of godly offspring. My daughter sings with Kyra in our youth service. My son was a member of Every Nation Campus uh, Youth Services in Katipunan when he was in college. The mission continues. The legacy lives on. You and I are called to go and minister. You and I are called to listen, to be open, to, to be present, to be missional. And because of that, someday we can tell the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, we were able to do it. Not by our own strength, but because you promised, you promised, you will never leave us and you will always be with us even to the end of the age. What are we waiting for? We do not go alone. Jesus goes with us. And that's my prayer for all of us. Let's not just get fed every Sunday. Let's go out. Do the mission.
Amen? You stand on your feet as we close. We were singing kanina, fire, fire, a little lit fire. Let it burn bigger and bigger. Let it burn in our hearts. My prayer is you have been lit by the Holy Spirit today. And that lighting in our hearts will grow stronger and stronger. So that when the time comes, it's not just you, but it's the Holy Spirit in you that will lead you to go out and minister to the next generation. Amen? Let's just.